Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. And you know, a lot of people have started asking me again, uh, why, why am I coming back and messing with keto diets? And I want people to understand. Uh, my reasons for doing this are, are evidence-based. They are based on anecdote, things like that. And I am not, I am absolutely not prescribing this sort of diet for everyone. And I think there are psychological benefits to doing so. And people can argue about that all they want. I've observed it in plenty of athletes over the years. Um, and I have actually done my best historically on that style of diet. I hit my best lifts ever as a power lifter in my 20s on that sort of diet. I don't have performance issues. And that's something that we need to look at some of these studies. And it's important to look at this. And people need to understand this is not so much pro-ketogenic when we look at some of this, but rather it's to say that the human machine is more adaptable than we give it credit for. In other words, it is very, very possible for athletes and, and everyone else to burn both glucose or fats once they're adapted well to one or the other as athletes, meaning you don't necessarily have to pick one or the other. So, so in other words, what I'm saying with a lot of this is that in terms of performance, in terms of body composition, in terms of all these things, that, that both fat and carbs are good, right? And just because I'm choosing to utilize more fat instead of carbs for, for a fuel source, that has to do with my own leptin, my own ghrelin levels. And we, you guys need to go look at the studies on that for people who are predisposed to obesity and people of different um, ethnic backgrounds and everything else, this stuff matters. And when we talk about stuff like this and like studies like this, we need to understand that it's showing that they're equal, right? This isn't saying, hey, I'm being pro-fat. It's saying I'm not being anti-fat right? And I'm not being anti-carbohydrate either. I'm saying that for my purposes and the purpose of my diets and my personal goals, this works fine. And that you can pick one or the other. You can run with it just fine. Um, that these are not really considered extremes. R the protein intake is more important than choices of fat or carbs. Fat and carbs, once you, you kind of go with one or the other or a mixture, ultimately just comes down to things like personal satiety, personal stomach comfort, personal appetite, personal energy levels. But in terms of performance, in terms of body composition, which of these two you choose to fill your non-protein calories with probably doesn't seem to matter. And it's studies like this that highlight that. And this was done on very serious athletes, like these are Ironman athletes. And they were given time to adapt to a ketogenic diet in one group and another, another group who stayed on a high carb diet. And once they were used to their form of diet and their body was used to burning that sort of fuel, it's exactly what we find that people who, who are keto adapted, and this is, this is leading research, guys. This is actual real research. This is a study. This is done by real experts with real PhDs uh, who are looking at this in the field who care about athletes, right? And this is what you find, that whatever you eat, that's what you tend to burn for fuel. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to make you burn more body fat, because that's not what any of this has to do with. This is not a, a fat loss study. This is an energy study for athletes. And that, here's what they find, that when their, their food is equal and protein is equal and everything else, that the athletes here, and these are, these are serious athletes, these Ironman athletes who are used to eating really high carbs, who continue to eat high carbs that day, and they go do a three hour run, when they're compared with keto adapted Ironman athletes, and that's what people need to understand, there, there are people in both groups who are winning world level sports and strength, power, endurance, everything else. Right? There are gold medalists and medalists in the Olympics in a variety of sports who do both sorts of methods. There are ones who do high carb, low fat, low fat, high carb, and people who do a mix of the two, right? There's a pretty good diversity at this point uh, because here's what matters at the end of the day. It's, it's, are they getting calories for fuel? That's what seems to matter. And people have a preference for which type sometimes they feel better on it, what they have more energy on. That's just an individual preference. It probably has to do with certain things with your individual digestive enzymes and, and ghrelin and leptin and insulin response and everything else, right? But what they found was that at the end of their three hour run, they all had similar levels of glycogen. In other words, the people who were eating the carbs burn more carbs for fuel. And those who are eating more fat or used to eating more fat burn more fat for fuel to the point where that's exclusively what they burn during their three hour run. 
Well, that makes sense, right? That shows you how adaptable the human machine is. That is not a damnation of carbohydrates nor a damnation of fat for athletes. That's saying, hey, we are such an amazing adaptable machine that our body will learn to burn effectively whatever it, it's used to eating for athletes, for elite level athletes. And the point they made here is not only that, but they saw glycogen replenishment. And that's kind of the, the point we get to of where uh, arguments that I've listened to and agreed with in the past with various evidence-based people, even though they didn't match my own personal anecdote. I've always gone with the, the experts on it who say that, but we're seeing more experts who are saying, no, that's not true, right? We're seeing people who are saying, no, that's not really true, guys. And it's data like this that supports it, that they're saying, well, you know, you need the, the carb loading and the, the post-training carbs and everything else for glycogen replenishment. Well, that's not what they found. That's not what they found in this study. They found that the keto adapted people not only used about the same amount of their glycogen stores that the high carb people did, they replenished themselves to full glycogen stores within so many hours without eating dietary carbohydrates. Now people would say, what? How did they do that? Why? That doesn't make sense. Well, it does. It does because we make glucose and in this case of these athletes they're just their bodies are used to replenishing glucose once they're adapted to doing this one they burn less glucose because they're not getting it for fuel all the time and two to replenish that which they burn because you will always burn some in training your brain always needs some all right you're going to burn some weightlifting you're going to burn some sprinting that we make it out of protein and fat right and a lot of people aren't aware of that that we we do make it out of out of fat also approximately one calorie out of every gram of fat you eat can be converted there is a pathway in the body and it has been found in recent years that we do utilize it can be used to create glucose whereas in with protein it's something like 40 percent of your protein intake can be converted to glucose that's under normal circumstances now for some of these keto adapted guys who are running higher proteins it might be higher but we know it's in the range of 40 percent so what does that mean? Well, that means out of, out of 900 calories, like if you're eating 900 calories of fat, about 100 calories of it can be turned into glucose. If you're eating about 400 calories of protein, around 200 calories of that can be converted to glucose to replenish glycogen stores. Well, that's, that's what we're seeing here. They're, they're getting their glucose for glycogen replenishment in their muscle tissue. They're just getting it from their protein and their fats. And they all have, there's no, there was no detectable difference in their replenishment. And if anyone doesn't think that a three hour run burns more total calories and glucose than your weight training session, you've got to be doing one brutally intense weight training session. Like what are you doing, 30 sets of squats? Right? Does anyone out there really think that what they ever do in a weightlifting session in the gym is going to burn as much fuel as a three-hour run? For a three-hour run for an elite athlete? I don't think so. Yet here we are seeing the exact same size glycogen stores after the run and, and later on with their replenished in full. So in other words, these keto-adapted athletes don't have issues of glycogen stores. They're not getting low glycogen stores from being on low carbohydrates once they're, they're used to it. They can replenish it off of protein and off of fat. So that tells us that our prevailing theory there is wrong, that no, to have full glycogen stores even for an athlete and for, for muscle growth and everything else, the data we have is showing that you may not really need to eat very much in the way of carbohydrates. Um, and there are people out there who are showing it. There are serious lifters and other people who don't even do carb days, who have no problems. So I think the point here is that what I'm saying is that I'm not trying to be anti-carb at all with this. What I'm saying is, look, you can go either direction. You can be flexible with this. There is no one right and wrong way to do this. And as much as I might have said in the past, what well, appears to be because the experts are saying the higher carb is better. Well that's not really supported by the evidence. The evidence is saying, hey, you can go either direction, your body will adapt and you will be fine and you can have full glycogen and you can compete as an elite level athlete. That's what it's saying, 
right? That protein is really what, what matters most for our muscle growth and everything else. And where you choose to get the other calories, uh, we as people can be very, very flexible in whether we consume carbs or fats, right? We can be very flexible with it. And we can have our own reasons for picking it. Right, I'm being the opposite of dogmatic here, and I'm looking at the actual evidence. And I've been looking at the evidence here with an open mind, with a critical eye, and being critical of it, and I have been, um, but, but I'm with an open-minded skepticism. And what I'm finding is that my open-minded skepticism is telling me that there's mounting evidence saying maybe the people who are saying you have to do the carb loading, that's, that's the only way they don't appear to be right. They've got good theory behind it, but it's not panning out that way in real athletes when it's being really looked at in labs. It's just not. That, again, it's more of a testament of how flexible uh, humans can be in our dietary choices more than anything else. All right, guys, but well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.